Hello everyone and welcome to my channel. This video is about Thomas Sowell, who is an American economist. He is respected and he has written quite a lot. Now, I don't know why, but YouTube keeps recommending me his videos. And every time I see any of his videos, I always get angry. So I thought that now that I have a YouTube channel, let me make a video about this. Now, this video specifically has not much to do with Africa, except when he speaks about colonialism. But mainly this has to do with IQ, culture, and the last part is about colonialism. That just stopped me cold. Mm. After the Second World War, you've got large numbers of, of American troops remaining in Germany. For mm. that matter, there's still several tens of thousands there today. And both black and white American soldiers had children with German women. Mm. And Flynn discovered that those children growing up in Germany mm. showed no IQ differences at all. Mm. The, the, the black kids and the white kids, the same. Professor Flynn concluded that the reason was that the offspring of black soldiers in Germany grew up in a nation with no black subculture, yeah. close quote. Which means what? Which means they experienced exactly the same expectations? Is this the... They no, no, no. The expectations are external. The culture in which they grew up with was, was not the culture in which black kids grew up in America today. So they had... There's no gangster rap. Sometimes I don't know if this guy is serious or not. But, you know, we have to address that point anyway. He's saying that in Germany the children of the soldiers, regardless of their race, they had the same IQ level. But in America, there's an IQ difference. And that is because of gangster rap. Firstly, there is gangster rap in Germany. It's quite popular, actually. And secondly, in America, majority of the gangster rap albums are sold to white kids. Thirdly, and most importantly, what are the factors that determine IQ? As we all know, Two of the main factors are education and wealth. Now, those soldiers in Germany, their parents, they work in the same place, meaning they make as much money. They are all American soldiers' children, so they go to the exact same school. If you go to the same school, if your parents are making the same money, well, that would mean that your IQ levels are the same. But is that the case in America? Are black people and white people in America, are they making as much money? And are they going to the same schools? And the answer to that is absolutely no. In 2019, the median wealth of black household in the United States was $24,100. Compare that with 189,100 for white households. Do you understand the difference in wealth level? The typical black household had 12.7% of the wealth of the typical white household. Now, do they go to same school? As I said earlier, no. Two thirds of the minority of students still attend schools that are predominantly minority. So they go two thirds of the students of black children, they go to schools where they are the majority there are no white kids there and on top of that they are located in central cities and funded well below those in neighboring suburban districts recent analysts of data prepared for school finance cases in alabama new jersey new york louisiana and texas have found that every tangible measure from qualified teacher to curriculum offering schools serving greater numbers of students of color had significantly fewer resources than schools serving mostly white students. How can they have the same IQ if their schools are significantly lower standards? If they only get 12% of the wealth that this other group has, how in the world can they have the same level of IQ? So saying that in Germany, the, the children of soldiers have the same IQ, that proves that just shows that the problem is education and the problem is wealth. But this guy, he is for free market economics. He doesn't believe that the government has any role 
in education. He doesn't believe that government should do any wealth redistribution or any other government programs. His point, I don't understand even his point. He's basically saying that, well, black people and white people are the same. But yes, we already know that. So he's saying that the difference is culture. Well, <laughs> black culture is everywhere. You know, I'm African and I really listen to rap music. Like, what are you talking about? The black culture is everywhere. Majority of the people who consume black culture are not black people themselves. The key word among advocates of multiculturalism became diversity. Ah, yes. Sweeping claims for the benefits of demographic and cultural diversity have prevailed without a speck of evidence being asked for or given. Name a few institutions in which diversity is championed without so, w without evidence. Gosh, the question would be, name one way. Well, that isn't the case. Uh, I would say the whole Ivy League, uh, Stanford, uh, Berkeley. Corporate America? Yes. It is, it's, really, it's really miraculous almost. I mean, I can't think of a word that has gained such widespread use and which is utterly unchallenged without one speck of evidence. If you look at societies that are diverse, they have all they can do to avoid uh, bl mutual bloodshed. I mean, India, for example, is very diverse. And, and you know, the-, the, the It bar barely coheres as a nation. So. That, that's right. When, when, when India uh, was given its freedom by Britain and split into India and Pakistan, I mean, the number of people slaughtered between Hindus and Muslims ran into the hundreds of thousands. This is something else that he always argues for. He's basically saying here that multiculturalism is bad and there shouldn't be different cultures within one country. There should only be one culture, the white culture in America. He wants black people to forget their culture and everybody else to forget their culture and they should just all adapt and become white some miraculous way. I don't know how he imagined that to happen, but still. And he's using here India as an example. He's saying that after India got its independence from Britain, they fought wars and they fought wars because of they were Hindus and Muslims and a lot of people died. But we have to ask ourselves, was the problem Hindus and Muslims or is the problem the history of colonialism? Now, what he doesn't tell us is that India, the multicultural India that we know today, actually accounted for 24.4% of the global GDP in the year 1700. And that dropped to 4.2% in the year 1950. Also, India's share of global industrial output declined from 25% in the year 1750 to 2% in the year 1900. Why? Because the British, they came and they deindustrialized the whole country. They industrialized the UK, their own country, but they deindustrialized India. They also cessated of various craft industry, industry, destroyed them, dismantled them. Could you imagine somebody coming into your country and destroying all of your economy, burning your factories? causing unemployment in your country and then making you fight two world wars and you know they've never been paid for that they've never got their diamonds back they never got anything back so the problem is colonialism the problem is not that they're hindus and muslims the hindus and muslims have been living there for a long time and they were 25 percent of the world gdp they were multicultural then why were they doing so well before the British came, but are doing so badly after the British left. Maybe the problem is colonialism. Maybe the problem is not multiculturalism. Maybe. Malaysia, one of the more prosperous countries of Southeast Asia, population 23 million. Of those 23 million, about half are Malays, a quarter are Chinese, and about 7% are Indians. Mm -hmm. Care to give us a brief history of the affirmative action programs in Malaysia? The Chinese, first of all, were making uh, at least twice the income of the Malays. 
Uh, so no, what you have there is a minority. A quarter of the population is doing far better than any than, than the larger number of indigenous yeah. people. Yeah. And, okay. and what makes it even worse politically, I guess, is that the Chinese started out much poorer than the Malays mm -hmm. and passed them over the years simply because they had more, they saved more, they worked harder, etc. So the Chinese were very re much resented. This is another argument that he constantly uses. He brings up Malaysia in two different occasions, usually. One way he uses it is that he says, in Malaysia, the Chinese people are discriminated and they are richer than the local population. So black people should be doing fine and they can't complain in America because it's their fault that they are poor. It's the culture. And the proof of that is that, you know, the Chinese are doing better in Malaysia. And another way he uses this is to say that, you know, in Malaysia, the affirmative action hasn't worked. So he argues that affirmative action is useless in everywhere. Why are the Chinese richer than Malays in Malaysia? That's an interesting question. And there are many reasons for it. But one of the reasons is simply because of the history of colonization, because it was colonized by Britain. And they did in Malaysia the same thing that they did in India, where they would divide the people, you know, divide and conquer. And then they would give certain advantages to the minorities and they would you know favor the minorities so how that was done in in malaysia was that first of all these chinese and indians they were brought as laborers to the country a majority of them they stayed in the urban you know cities and they actually you know the chinese they had a lot of mining companies also though so they came as businessmen also M majority of the malays on the other hand they stayed in the villages they are till this day majority of them are farmers now the thing is that back then education was primarily offered in the urban areas so the indians and the chinese they had more access to that education and secondary education was only offered in english and in chinese and till this day the chinese they have their own educational system which is actually better than the other ones in the country all of those things resulted in the fact that you know they had higher levels of education they had more employment opportunities more business opportunities and they were able to gather generational wealth for decades and decades for generations and generations on the other hand Malaysians they were just farmers they didn't really have the opportunity to generate generational wealth and they were disfavored from entering certain businesses and others now, of course, the Chinese also currently benefit from the fact that China is the largest economy in the world and they speak Chinese and they have easier access to doing business there. But there's a modern phenomenon. Historically, it's mainly been due to the differences of the places they live in. This is very different from America, where, you know, the Chinese, they weren't enslaved. They didn't suffer from Jim Crow. They were actually favored in many ways. Now... I don't see people favoring the black Americans in America. I've never seen historically them having more opportunities and access to education than the white people. So, of course, they are not going to be better off than the white population in America. And that comparison is just idiotic. And the problem is with all of these clips is that this guy, he just brings up a random fact. And if you look at it closely, you will see that it doesn't prove his point. It actually proves the opposite. Because here's a video from Malaysia. This is from race riots in 1964. And you know, if you can see, a lot of the Malaysians that demonstrated it, it's, it's regarded as one of the worst days in Malaysian history. But the thing is that this happens in America. The same sort of dissatisfaction, the same sort of anger, it's always happened in America. But the Malaysian government, they dealt with it. They constituted very strict forms of affirmative actions. I do think that they maybe went a little bit too far. They even wrote some of those things in their constitutions. But the thing is that they did what they thought was the right choice. And looking at Malaysia now, there are still tensions, you know, racial tensions. But there is not the same level of, you know, this 
disparity between the races. Wealth creation to uh, the acquisition of skills and the employment of skills in a, in a disciplined way and also uh, in, a, uh, in a frugal way in, in terms of, of, of lifestyles. Yeah. But others would, would attribute uh, the generation of poverty, the obverse of wealth, to uh, colonialism, imperialism, exploitation, uh, yes. uh, economic exploitation. How, how do you handle handle those arguments? Well, insofar as those arguments are meant seriously, you can simply look at evidence. Well, insofar as they're purely political arguments, they're saying what people want to hear. Obviously, there are people who would much rather hear that than to hear the other, because if you think that's the problem, then there's not, there's not only a, a quicker solution, uh, but there's a more, m more emotionally and morally satisfying solution, uh, namely you fight against the exploiters and so on. If you look at the third world, for example, those parts of the third world where the uh, imperialist powers have come in, have typically been the more advanced parts of it. They've been the most most prosperous ones. Even if they weren't prosperous before they got there, they became the more prosperous parts. Those parts of the third world that the imperialists have never touched are, almost without exception, the very poorest places on this earth. So you don't find any, exploit, uh, any explanation for poverty and colonialism? Uh, the reverse, perhaps? Oh, absolutely. That when, when the Romans, for example, invaded uh, the British Isles, they conquered uh, the southern part of uh, Britain, but they never conquered Scotland. Uh, and for centuries thereafter, perhaps for a thousand years thereafter, Scotland was far behind England in economic and cultural development because England had the advantage of tying into the whole Roman civilization and everything that it had created to some extent percolated down through the British. Uh, that doesn't mean the British were happy with the Romans being there. You know, a thousand years later, Churchill could say, we owe London to Rome, but that's a thousand years later, and Churchill didn't have to go through what those people went through. So I'm not saying this is good for the people who were there, but in the, but in the longer run, of course, England became what it was because the Romans came, and Scotland re finally developed only after England conquered Scotland, and then the culture that developed in England then could spread into, into Scotland as well. Well, does this suggest then that in addressing poverty in today's world there ought to be a latter-day reincarnation of imperialism or colonialism in some form? No, uh, because I think politically it's impossible. Uh, they're, they're, I, I hear from the perverse parts of uh, some independent nations. I don't even know where to start with this one. All I have to say that in the Haitian Revolution when they were fighting the French, before they went out to fight the French, the first thing they did is that they killed the collaborators, you know, the Haitians who were working with the French. And the reason is because they do more damage than anyone else, you know. This white man who's interviewing him, he could never say that. He could never say that, you know what, imperialism and colonialism was good for Africa. You know, enslaving all those people that came to America, that was all fine and dandy, you know, it was great. And the only reason he says that it can't happen is because, you know, politically it's not possible. But if it was politically feasible, if the American government decided to do it again, he would be one of the supporters of that. Now, what is the thing that he's talking about here? He's saying that, you know, Rome developed Britain. Well... As far as I know, there was not much in Britain before Rome conquered it. So what the Romans did is that, first of all, they unified the country, they built roads and infrastructure, and then when they left, they left. And there wasn't, you know, natural resources in, in Britain that they could benefit that much of. Of course, there probably was some benefits to them, but still, it was a different type of colonialism. Now, compare that. Compare that to South African apartheid, where the local population were treated like scum, they were, their lands were taken, their mines were taken, all their resources were taken from them. Compare that to Congo, where they killed 20 million people. Compare that to Somalia, where they dismantled, you know, Somalia, they used to have railroad system. The British dismantled that system. And I also said before, you know, the British, they dismantled the Indian economy. How was that good for India? They had 24% of the global GDP, and the British came. When the British left, they had 4%. How is that good? Please, sir, explain it to me. In which way were the countries of, that were being colonized were doing better? In every part of the colonized world, the GDP, they dropped 
the Chinese economy was dismantled. The African economy was dismantled. The laborers were taken and slaves. You understand? I, there was nothing good about the European colonialism. How can something be good for you if you are doing better before that things happen? And then he's saying that 1,000 years later, somebody said that, you know, Rome, uh, Britain owns London to Rome. Like, what are you talking about? Colonialism is not even over. French has, haven't they haven't left. They are still fighting in Sahel. They still have soldiers. They are still robbing the natural resources. It is not over yet. So maybe 1,000 years there will be an African leader who will stand up and be like, you know what, colonialism gave us, you know, the identity of being African or whatever. But that will be 1,000 years later. We are still fighting the anti-colonial battle. And to suggest that what happened in Africa, to suggest what the French did in those colonies when they destroyed the schools, they, you know, even the language, those languages don't exist anymore. Because the people are speaking French now. How is that good for the local people? In which way does that benefit them? Now, every country in Africa has suffered from it. And the thing is, right, if he is right, Ethiopia should do, do much worse than other countries. But it would seem that Ethiopia is actually doing better than other African countries. And it wasn't colonized. Now, of course, currently there is something going on in Ethiopia. But... Still, the point stands. It's not worst off in any way, shape, or form. It has actually been historically sort of a bit better off. And the countries that had stronger colonialism are doing worse now. Because look at the colonies of France. They are the poorest countries in Africa because France just won't let go. They are still milking the cow. So this is the kind of things like people like him, there are, you know, he's an American, but there are lots of Africans like this who are, you know, they are black, they are African, they say that we are African, but what they say and what they do is what the colonialists think. This is what the colonialists thought. They thought that black people are worthless, their culture is, uh, you know, beneath other cultures, and they should just become white. That's what he's been doing for all his life. He's tried to be a white man, but... It's not good for us. And our culture is greater. I'm not saying it's greater than other cultures. But it is important that we have our own culture. And that's the only way we can go anywhere. And we should reject colonialism in every way, shape or form. And to suggest that we should be thankful to our colonial master for destroying our economy. You know, all the different countries in Africa... Many of them, they had navies before colonialism. They were dismantled. Their economies were dismantled. Their infrastructure was dismantled. And there was nothing positive about it. And people also lost their identity, their history, their culture. So in which way was it good? In which way? What bothered me the most is that white man's smile. You know, he was smiling there like he was so happy to hear somebody say that they did good. That, you know, somebody patting them on the back. Good that you colonized the rest of the world. You know, you are the saviors of this world. But um, anyways, I hope you like this video. This really has nothing to do with anything. It's just a personal little video because these clips annoyed the hell out of me. Now, next time i will probably do a video about related to african affairs but thank you all for watching see you on the next one